I never understood what it meant to be a citizen of a place because I never stayed in a place very long uh, until I came to Arkansas and you know, I've been here nearly 30 years. I could go around the world, finest diamonds, precious pearls, they'd all turn to dust in my hand. Seven wonder city streets, ocean air and mountain peaks, they are not the finest in the land. Much more than these I have seen firsthand. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing like coming home to you. And no matter where I go and no matter what I do, there ain't nothing like coming home to you. There ain't nothing like coming home to you. He grew up uh, in a context that was not, uh, you know, uh, one of the coast or in New England. And so there is um, a, a kind of common man's background that comes through. It's a genuine sense of caring for ordinary people. You know, I finally came to the conclusion that rather than me going to the world, I'm going to bring the world to me. The Ozarks are old, but there's a, the elevation and section uh, is, is really interesting the way it intersects with the work. So you're, you're constantly thinking about how you interact with uh, nature. You know, like things like the ramble, for example, like things like that, you know, the hollow and things like that, that you find rich culture, the underbelly of places, we find that as the source of inspiration to our architecture and we try to cherish that. I think that people are drawn to the work that he does because, you know, initially they want to try to pin him and call the work that we do as very regional, like it's he's a regionalist. But at the same time, the work, I, I feel like it's very progressive. I think what Marlon is very aware of is that, not only that dichotomy, but working in the space of that dichotomy and of grasping even from what many people might see as uh, lacking in value or even la and certainly lacking in aesthetic value of actually being able to extract from that uh, a form of beauty. And I think one of the things that has become ever more apparent in our world, in our world of architecture, is that it needs to be more and more about service. We need to be able to serve people, people without necessarily a lot of money or power. And I think Marlon's work has always been about service. We interviewed several people and I think one of the reasons I was enthused by Marlon is I consider him a very spiritual man. So he saw what symbolism can do, and he deliberately worked into our church symbolism that he had thought about, he told me, for many years. So we've left some of our church original where when it was a garage, so a person can see that you enter the kingdom of heaven as you are. They were really wanting a dome and couldn't afford a dome. Uh, we inspected a dome, even you know, made a big dome out of fiberglass. They couldn't afford that. The contractor couldn't afford to, uh, or didn't think he had the skills to make a really acceptable dome. And so we're at it kind of, we're in the middle of construction. It's like, well, what are we going to do? And he said, give me a day and let me think about it. Came back said, I've got a friend of mine who's a, he's a metal worker and he lives 20 miles out in the mountains. Uh, and uh, he, he, for a couple of cases of beer, he, he would trade us a satellite dish. And that could be the dome. So that's what we did. We, created him some beer, we got the satellite dish, we brought it back, we skim coated it with plaster, we jacked it up, put it in the ceiling, put a Pantocrator of Jesus. It's great, they got their dough. I actually believe that uh, working 
in an under-resourced environment uh, equipped him with uh, um, an agility, a flexibility, uh, a willingness to make a change uh, and still keep the integrity of the work whole. No matter what the budget is in Marlin's projects, it doesn't affect the amount of care that he brings to the work, and the work is infused with care and joy. Resourcefulness and the economy of things contribute to I kind, of, kind of the American story, right, of making something with relatively few things. Meeting with Marlin himself, we sat around an open table and had probably about a three-hour conversation. And uh, then he just kind of said, okay, I think I've got it. And he just jotted down a couple little quick drawings on some yellow paper and uh, said, what do you think about these? And one of those drawings ended up being exactly what the building looks like. I wanted to try to really make something so that when children were here, they felt like this space was specifically for them. But at the same time, a, a office building takes a lot of beating, so it needed to be something that was very functional uh, and useful, and it, it has turned out to be that. And that's key, because if it, if it doesn't do that, it's not going to be loved, right, in time. Uh, no matter how many, you know, lead certifications or other types of things, quantitative things you can check the boxes on, it has to be loved, and it has to, has to, you know, dignify. Is the word I like like to use a lot. Have to have some dignity in it. As one tends to get more busy, it's easy to uh, leave teaching behind. But Marlin, with his teaching, has always been deeply committed. I love the interpersonal aspect of. Uh, practice and teaching. The thing I really love is, you know, you go into a design studio with 15 students and they're all focused on their individual sort of pursuit uh, of a problem that you've given them or a project. And it's amazing to see 15 different ways you can approach it. And I learned from that because, oh, there's no one answer. There's no one truth in all of this. That, to me, is really important because the vitality of the profession I think in many ways is determined by the vitality of the education. The gold medal being awarded to Marlin recognizes in the first place that good architecture, even great architecture, can exist well outside of, we'll call them the usual suspects of America's great cities, and can occur actually in America's great landscapes. It, it's very cool that the profession really recognize the kind of work that we do because a lot of, you know, uh, practice as, you know, there are people that are practicing in the middle, they don't always get to get that kind of commission. So really understanding that the AIA is recognizing that you don't need to be practicing in a big uh, cities, for example, where those kind of work are possible to recognize that there's still good architecture being made. Well, in my perspective, Marlin won the gold medal because he makes people happy. He makes people have a little joy in their heart. When they can see his work, it makes them rejoice. He exhibits some of the qualities of a very rare group of professionals that are tenacious. They uh, love their craft. They aspire to practice it at the highest level. And I think one might honestly say that Marlin's uh, best work may still yet be ahead of them. It's very important to develop a core set of principles in terms of how you live and how you live. Uh, they shouldn't be that different. Um, and I believe that those principles and those core values will help you direct circumstance as it comes in life, in living and practicing. And without that, circumstance will direct you. And I think that's the difference in many ways between being good enough and being really good. There ain't